Welcome back to the Bible study, Jonah chapter 1, with my friend John and Derek. It's good to see you back here, and we are going to drill further into chapter 1 of Jonah. I remember when we started Isaiah, it was, we had no idea how it was going to flow, and we found that we were spending weeks <laughs> on the first few verses of Isaiah, but I don't, I, I, I don't anticipate the same here, but there are, some very, there are some absolute gems within this uh, passage. So I'm going to read it, and Derek will pray. I'll just read the first few verses. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose, arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Thanks, Derek. Lord, thank you that we can come together around your word and we thank you especially for the book of Jonah, which is such an awesome uh, revelation of your love and also a, a prefigurement of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for just speaking to each one of our hearts today and Holy Spirit, you be the one who makes the word come alive. We ask you to do that with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, often what we find is that we, there's something from the previous week that we, that we want to just unpack a little more. So I want to try that first with, with John because we were talking uh, you know, about um, what was motivating Jonah in terms of his relationship with the Lord. And there, there, obviously, there were conflicts going on but also this grand stepping out of, um, of taking the gospel to the Gentiles, which was conceptually was a massive leap. Yes. And, and it sort of has a parallel. And I, I see, and I'm quite simple, so I see the place Joppa in our scripture here, and I think of Peter. Peter just, yes. uh, let's just uh, have, cover that, and then we're, we're going to talk about Tarshish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it, it definitely, well, it, it doesn't prefigure the gospel because the gospel has existed since the foundation of the earth, but it, it, it prefigures it in the sense of the way it's being revealed to the world and the way that we're not able to understand it. Um, but poor old Jonah, you know, he, he does get a bad press. He, we, we, we're so simplistic in our judgment of this man, but he was a man just like we are. And, and if you place yourself in, in Jonah's shoes in 800 BC, somewhere around there, um, where, he's, where he's living in Israel, and he's walking with the Lord. He, you know, one suspects he was a teacher uh, with a prophetic ministry. And so he was well known and he was communing with the Lord and suddenly he gets this instruction. He's probably asleep and the Lord says to him, wake up, arise and go to Nineveh. And he thinks, well, one could almost produce an expletive. <laughs> you know, you can imagine how he must have felt. And, and he might have thought, is that you, Lord? Is that my imagination? And he's all this time, you know, the, I, this, this sense of, of purpose is coming upon him. And he's terrified. He's terrified. Why is he terrified? Because he's being sent to the Gentile world. This, this contradicts everything he knows about God and Israel and, and, and the relationship between God and Israel that he's grown up with. The Again, Gentile. as we often do, there's a challenge for us today, you know, to go to the so-called yeah. Gentile world or the unchurched world yeah, and knock on right. doors. And it is quite it is. scary. It's thing, quite it? scary. Yeah. And, and, and he, 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 this is what he's being told to do. Now, as, as far as we know, it's not recorded, as far as we no, no other prophet before, before Jonah has been asked to do this and, and none after him before Jesus and then 
Peter and Paul um, had, had been asked to do it. So this is it's quite dramatic. Huge. This is dramatic. But not only is it dramatic in terms of him stepping out to go there, he knows that all of Israel, certainly those surrounding him, those believing uh, people sur uh, uh, surrounding him and the, and the religious leadership, are not going to understand. And they might even cut him off. Uh, and see it as a blasphemous act, a treacherous, traitorous act, if you like, against the God of Israel. So he is in a very difficult place, and he does what lots of people do. He runs from it. He runs from the it. The amazing thing about the scriptures is that we, you know, of course, be ye separate, be ye as a holy people, separate from these surrounding nations, and yet um, woven into the scriptures it is you Gentiles appear. And in the line of Jesus, thing, things are happening. So, you know, the caricature of the Bible as, as to being some sort of prejudice against anyone who isn't Jewish is not correct. Mm. It's just, not, it's just see, see what... Well, yeah. Genesis 12, yeah. Abraham, yes, is promised, I will bless you, but also I will make you a blessing. Yeah. So it was always God's wanting, wanted them to be holy, but also wanted them to be the communicators of of God's truth beyond their borders. Yeah. And, um, but, but the Israelite mindset tended to just be focused. We are the holy people of God and they're dogs. And so they were, uh, that kind of got in a bit. Mm. So now we, we're, going, we're going to sort of <coughs> uncover, and the wonderful thing about Bible study is that, that there are nuggets within the verses uh, where, you know, that don't that seem completely counterintuitive, and that, uh, but then there's a significance that sort of spans well beyond the story. And I think, um, uh, well, I know that uh, Derek is a scholar on some of these these detailed areas of scripture. So uh, we don't want to just wave <laughs> not chapter one away and go into chapter two without talking about um, this place, Tarshish, where Jonah wanted to go in disobedience. I mean, it has to yes, happen. I mean, it's, it's almost amusing because God says, arise, go to Nineveh, which is, what, over 500 miles northeast. Yeah. And, and it seems like Jonah's obeying. He says, but Jonah arose, you know, so he set himself to, to take action, but instead he goes exactly, practically exactly the opposite direction, which is, you know, to the, to the west. So it's almost like Jonah... <laughs> That's the last thing he wants to do for various reasons. And so what does he do? He, he f travels away, it says, from the presence of the Lord. He flees, really, to the, from the presence of the Lord. I, so I guess the presence of God is associated with the temple in Israel. So he, he wants to... He, he, the idea is if I, get, if I just kind of resign my commission... Go as far away as possible. God will leave me alone, and He See, won't I find ask it me to do this I, I, thing. I really. find it strange for picking up on this point about him, him not really wanting to go to the Gentiles, so to speak. But yet he goes even in a, for even a more distant um, but, Gentile but, king. Yes, but it, it's of course it has. There's particular reasons with Assyria because Assyria yeah. is viciously cruel. Right. Um, it was well known for its cruelty. You know, and in fact, you can see pictures of that in the British Museum, yeah. where they literally, they reigned by terror because they couldn't afford to garrison all the cities they conquered. They, they, they literally created terror. So once they captured a city, they would, for instance, peg the people to the ground and skin them alive, <laughs> would be one thing, and then hang the skins on the wall. Another thing they invented was, was they would put a stake through your chest and then you'd be staying a bit like impaled, that's it. A bit like an early form of crucifixion, I suppose. Um, that, you know, and a lot of horrific stuff that, that they were well known for. And, and so, it's saying the cry the Lord heard, as it were, something yeah. rose up, you know, and reached the Lord's ear, as it yeah. were. And, and part of it, probably, he, he, yes, it's the last place he would have wanted to go to. But also because I think he knew that that God was warning Israel, if they didn't repent, God was going to use Assyria mm. as, as an instrument of judgment on them. Yeah. So he was wanting Assyria to, to be destroyed right. because that would be a major threat removed from Israel. So in a way, he's very nationalistic, mm. 
but he put his national and nationalism, you know, is is good in its place. Uh, but in a sense, that was more important to him perhaps than the will of God. You know, sometimes I I, I think we have to humble ourselves before God and. Uh, Jonah had to learn this, that certain things are above our pay grade. Yeah. You know, it, it wasn't for Jonah to question God. <laughs> yeah. God, you're getting this wrong. This isn't the right thing to do. You know, it's not for us to, to play that game. Mm. If God says it, we do it, mm. um, even if it doesn't really fit with our ration, okay. rationalization. So let's, let's start by putting into, as we did last week, um, and we ranged quite widely, but put into context the, the ge geography, uh, you know, that, uh, and I suppose the, uh, the culture of the time was these Phoenicians traveling out trading from Tyre to distant lands to pick up their, you know, materials. That they, they were the could trade. they were the master traders of, of the time. Yeah, yeah. and we l and there are a number of verses on Tarshish in the Bible. It, it okay. plays a role. Um, this Jonah verse is a key verse. Okay. Because it's clear that what Jonah wants to do is get as far away from the presence of God as possible. So the first clue in deciding what Tarshish is, it, to the people living at that time, it had to be the furthest, most remote location that they knew. And clearly to the west, because they were going from Joppa. So it wasn't to the east, it was to the west. And you have to ask, what was the furthest known location at that time? My thesis is, what I believe, is that it's, it is the United Kingdom, mm -hmm. Corn Cornwall in particular. Um, that, that is Tarshish. Now, if you read most of the books, people just trot out the usual thing, it's somewhere in Spain, you know, because yeah. that's the western side of the Mediterranean. Yeah. Um, but actually, all the evidence, as far as I can see, says that it is the United Kingdom. And the reason why it's interesting to discuss this is because Tarshish figures in, into some end time prophecies. Yeah. So if it is the United Kingdom, it's, it is actually telling us something about yeah. us in our situation right now, yeah. you know. But one reason is Spain wasn't the, the greatest, uh, the furthest point, the, but the United Kingdom was. Mm. Further, you had to go through the Straits of... And in those days then, uh, 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 and I mean, we know that our our culture goes back thousands of years here in, in, the, in the British, what I call the British Isles, but the United Kingdom will do. Um, it, it's, we know that, but is there, is there evidence of, of the Phoenicians visiting Britain? Uh, yes, I think it's established that the Phoenicians, who were the master traders, they actually, for a long time, were the only ones really who knew how to get to the United Kingdom, because it wasn't easy. Mm. Um, but we know it because of through tin, and I think we need to get, okay. point out Ezekiel 27. Yeah. This is a prophecy against Tyre, uh, because Tyre was the major base for the Phoenician traders. Okay. And um, which is in present-day Lebanon. Yeah. And how much of it do we need to just read? Just verse 12. Do you want to read it, John? Um, if you yes, I would we'll do for now. Tarshish yeah. was your merchant because of your many luxury goods. They gave you silver, iron, tin. Cornwall, and lead for your goods. Mm. And it's the key, the key here is that um, these metal, all these metals can be found um, in Britain, but the thing is tin is very hard to find. Tin was very important, for instance, in the, we talk about the Bronze Age, you need tin to be combined with copper, and yes, copper might well have been mined in Spain, but tin really the main source for tin and in ancient Wales, times. And Wales, by copper is quite strong in Wales. Wales, um, and there's tin in Wales too. But the, the main ancient source uh, for tin is the United Kingdom. And any Bronze Age artifacts that they found using isotopes, they've actually um, located it to the tin that came from Cornwall. So that tells us that, that the United Kingdom was known. Some people say, oh, nobody even knew it existed. That's not true. We know for sure that the Phoenicians would have traded, even back in the Bronze Age, let alone 800 BC. Um, they would so have that, traded. That, uh, for me, is, it, it is, I, I hope it is also for the viewers. I mean, it's a fascinating yes. insight. It, it really is. and and. Of course, that there, we can talk about end times prophecies, but there, there was also a prophecy against Tyre. 
which was exactly fulfilled. Fulfilled. Um, with the, the Nebuchadnezzar, you know, when he he literally threw it into the sea. And Alexander the Great. Yeah, and uh, yeah. So that is, you know, the the Bible should be taken seriously. The Phoenicians kept it secret for a time, and eventually the Romans fa found out from the Phoenicians. Yeah. But for instance, even when Solomon sent ships to Tyre, right, he had to do it with the with the Phoenician help. Right. If, well, you can read right. about that. Yeah. And and um, but the round trip from from in Solomon's time, it was a round trip, not a direct trip, but they would trade and collect stuff en route. It was three, thrown three me years. into my childhood to a poem called yeah. Cargoes that said, Quin Kareem of Nineveh from distant Ophir, rowing home to Palestine. It's like rowing home to Haven in sunny Palestine with a cargo of sandalwood, cedarwood, and sweet white wine or something. I, I mean, it, it, this is the name of the game, wasn't it? Trading. Yeah. With, with a cargo and of apes and peacocks, sandalwood, cedarwood, and sweet white wine. Um, it even mentions Nineveh in there, I just, <laughs> just thought of that. But it, it was um, the, the Phoenicians w were very, very wealthy, weren't they? They, they commanded yeah. the seas. I mean, tin was, was quite hard to get, and that's why. So you get this phrase, ships of Tarshish, all right? Yes. These are very specially constructed ships. So we would call them when ocean... When we get the phrase, where's the phrase? Well, they're in the Bible. Yeah, okay, yes, it um, we'll find it. You know, the ships of Tarshish. Oh, by the uh, way, yes. we, don't, we don't have Ian. Uh, Ian would immediately find, you know, on his iPad, you know, those verses. And it doesn't actually mean that they were built in Tarshish. Yeah. Um, but they were ships, or even that they always went to Tarshish necessarily, but they were ships that were able to handle the Atlantic Ocean, for example. Mm. They, they, they were ships that could handle long sea voyages. Yeah. And so they were specially constructed ships and they were called ships of Tarshish mm. because it needed more than the normal type of vessel to actually make that journey. So we're not talking about Spain. Mm. We're talking about something beyond Spain, beyond because the gates Spain, of Spain Gibraltar. Spain is basically just going round the islands, obviously the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean. Can, can kick up a fuss, yeah. but oh, yes. the Bay of Biscay is another yeah. ball game. Yeah. Going out through the, the Straits of Gibraltar. Gibraltar, you say you're in a different ball game, as you yeah. say. Mm -hmm. And so some people would say, and, and so it needed, it's, it's more than Spain. It's yeah. somewhere beyond, and we know that they knew about the British Isles. Mm. In fact, the Greeks would, you know, this is 400 BC, they knew that the, the tin came from somewhere at the ends of the earth, but the Phoenicians actually kept it quite secret because they, they had the monopoly, you see. Uh, and, and they knew it was a long journey, and that's why you need these special ships of Tyre. And that's why Solomon's round journey was three years, mm. you see. So we're not talking about, we're talking about the furthest possible point. And the other reason it can't be Spain, actually, an interesting uh, quote here from an Assyrian king that followed after Sennacherib called Ezahadon. Mm. He, he claims all the kings from the islands amidst the sea, from the, from the country Cyprus, he has a fancy name, but it's Cyprus, which is an island, mm. as far as Tarshish. So here he describes Tarshish as an island further west of Greece. And, and it says, they all bow to my feet and I receive their tribute. So he claims the, he, he, this Tarshish is an island. Mm. So I, all the evidence, the tin, the, the fact that it, Jonah went as far as possible, what is the furthest possible point? Well, obviously they didn't go to America. Um, it has to be the United Kingdom. Mm. Mm. So the, the, uh, what, what, it's kind of become a tradition that it's Spain. Yeah. But, um, but that's the best, speculation. The best evidence yes. is and there is tin in Spain, but it isn't primarily Not known. Really. known. Not there's really. No, is there none? I don't no. think so. Um, I just think there's another scripture that talks about the isles afar off. And Lance Lambert always used to say, well, you know, that, that fits. Yes. But this is much more specific. Yes. Um, but when it said the ships of Tarshish, are we saying they could even have been built in Tarshish? Well, no, no, uh, they're the, just the ships know, going instance, to Tarshish. Um, I think it's correct. Uh, for instance, when we started trading, let's say, with India and mm. the East, 
they, we would call ships India men. That's true. That's yeah. right. Okay, yeah. so, so, I mean, so their origin was the the initial reason for these ships was to get to Tarshish because of the tin that was so valuable and yeah. so essential that they they needed this tin. So they built these special ships called yeah. ships of Tarshish. Yeah. But later, this term got to be used for any ocean-going vessel. You know, if you yeah. if you're going to do a big trip, say to India, yeah. or or go around the the Cape. You, you, you would a need for, you'd need a yeah. ship of Tarshish. Doesn't yeah. mean you're necessarily going to Tarshish. So the question now is, I, I, I know that there there are there is a relevance in end time prophecy. What is the relevance for Jonah first of going to Tarshish? Why? Well, why? Just because it's the furthest it, place it, you we're can told go to. away from the presence of the Lord. Yes. So he wants to get as far away, out of reach. Yeah. Now, I, I know he probably knew as a prophet he couldn't really get away from God, but psychologically he's thinking, if I can just what get What does that say of, of reach? OK, put it this way around. What does it say of Tarshish? <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, if that's the place to be away from the presence of God. Well, I see it in physical terms okay. uh, myself. Yeah. OK, OK. But um, yeah. you, you might okay. say maybe... That we, we were very backslidden in those John, days. John, what do you think of this thesis? <laughs> yeah, I'm fascinated. Yeah. And I think, I think that, that link to tin yeah. is, is, is a powerful argument. It's because not Britannia conclusive, isn't it in the name of Britain. powerful Britain argument. Tin. I, I may be completely mm. simplifying, but I think there is something even in, in our name. The Greeks call it the, the Tin Isles. The Tin Isles. We were, we were actually known as the Tin Isles. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I just it's in, very interesting. Because tin was quite very rare and very expensive, and that's why it was, although it was a horrendous journey for them to get there, it was well worth it. Because yeah. for uh, me, on face value, the, the Bible is not just a, li a little, you know, collection of stories by a nomadic tribe somewhere, you know, that we've never heard of. It, it seems to cover the whole globe. I mean, mm. it, it, there, there are prophecies that, that Lance said could even be about China. You know, uh, the, the land of Sinim, it says, that they shall come from Sinim. And, and, and Lance became very excited about the, the, Jew, the Jewish community in China. And, and uh, it is amazing how they came from all corners of the earth. And that there are, it is relevant. It's not just a fact of, oh, oh we are the domain <coughs> of Christendom, mm. and there's another domain of, of Buddhism or some other or the Aztecs, there's something all encompassing about the scriptures. So I think I th the fact that we are in in Britain, in the British Isles, um, I think the Lord does want to speak to us mm. on, on this subject. Well, it is very relevant to our situation right now, especially post Brexit, mm. because Tarshish appears in end time prophecies. Mm. Um, mm. And in fact, there's one that um, Ezekiel 38, I've, I've yeah. written a book about, if I can Well, no, it. we don't oh, mind flagging. The, uh, <laughs> we don't mind product placement here. For the uh, imminent There's invasion. So few products to go around. The imminent invasion of Israel, because uh, this is, um, okay. you know, it's set after Ezekiel 37, yep. which is, you know, the famous passage of the, the bones coming together and flesh yes. coming on the bones, and yep. it's all about the restoration of Israel having been scattered to the nations. Mm. And in the, in the setting of this restoration of Israel, um, is this Ezekiel 38 chapter, mm. which obviously is a very important event. That it's a prophecy that hasn't been fulfilled, yeah. and yet it gives a, in great detail an invasion from um, Gog, yeah. you know, of the land of Magog, mm. which I believe is Russia. Russia. And, but also it's clear that Turkey and Iran, and, and it says many other nations are involved, mm. and they're going to invade the mountains of Israel. Mm. Um, which I believe isn't Israel proper, but it's what we call the West Bank. It's the, the disputed area to kind of, I, I'm guessing, to impose. But you believe it is future and it hasn't, it it hasn't, hasn't been Well, fulfilled. it hasn't been fulfilled, and I'm very much a literalist, you know. Yeah. I take it the Bible as plainly as, as possible. So, am I. so that has to be fulfilled. And then after this prophecy is the prophecy from chapter 40 onwards of the millennium, essentially. Mm. So what you've got is an event that's going, that's going to happen after Israel's regathered to the land, which has been fulfilled, mm. and they're occupying the mountains of Israel, mm. which is the occupied territory, yeah. you know, yeah. the world calls the occupied territory. Yeah. And, but it's before 
the return of Christ. Mm. And so that's why I say it could happen any time. And, and the, the political alignments are all there. Yes, yes. So the most the interesting thing. Yeah, well, I was going to say, for the first time ever, these three nations, Iran, Turkey and Russia, are mm. all placed in Syria, yeah. in, in, yes. in a, in a, in a third right. country, as it yeah, were. Exactly. Quite, so quite they're amazing. there. Yeah. Um, I always found it amazing that, you know, that, that, that Russia's termed the bear, and it talks about the, you know, the land of the north and Moscow being due north of Jerusalem. Yeah. It, it is quite profound. The, the other thing that is becoming aligned, you mentioned Brexit, is how close Britain and Israel, they, they are converging in, in many areas of technology and, um, you know, tr training of intelligence and military. It's a l very close alignment, which um, actually hasn't, th 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 there's been, of course, we're democratic nations, so there is this tendency to, to, to be in alliance, but uh, post-Brexit and with the, the vaccination programs and the op potential opening up of what they call the Green Corridor um, of travel between um, Britain and Israel is, and the fact that we're second on the list, I think, after Israel in terms of the level of vaccinations. Right. don't want to date this program too much, but we, we have a, a, um, our respect for Israel and its achievements as a nation, maybe not by the BBC, but as a nation, I think has grown. Mm. considerably in recent years. And that's what prophecy indicates. Yeah. Especially if Britain, well, if Britain is Tarshish, that is. Yes. Um, because a lot, end time, certain end time prophecies only make sense if Britain is Tarshish. Yeah. And, and in particular, verse 13 is the verse we want to look at. Of um, chapter? Of chapter 38, because okay. it mentions the nations that... You don't mind, John, that we follow these this script. So no. if, can you read it? Yes, um, yeah. sure. This is Ezekiel 38, verse 13. Yeah. Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, and all their young lions will say to you, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to take great plunder? Mm. So these nations object to this yes. invasion. They, they are not on the side of um, Russia, of the know, host, hostile uh, Iran and so okay. on. Uh, they are actually on the side of Israel, you, would, you might say. Mm. Um, and uh, it's a v fascinating, most unlikely alliance going on here. Mm. There, there's so many things you could say, but some people could say all they, all they can do is, is, is say something. But actually, there's no chance to actually do anything because God himself says, this one's mine. Yeah. He rolls up his sleeve and he actually starts judging yeah. those invading armies. So there's no opportunity for them, but mm -hmm. God actually records those people who are against this invasion. Yeah. And, and of course, what they're saying is, or you might be pretending to fix the, 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 the Palestinian situation, but really you're doing it for your own economic gain is the real reason you're, mm. you're, you're taking this action. But it's interesting that, for instance, it's most unlikely because, but let's just say this, Tarshish, if it's the United Kingdom, of course, the United Kingdom's always been symbolized by a lion. And here it talks about Tarshish and her young lions. So whoever Tarshish is, it's a colonial power, if you like, that has lots of young lions. Yeah. That, of course, fits. Yeah. Now, you could say, well, Spain is a colonial power. It had yeah. lots of young lions, mm. but, but it's not a force today. Mm. You know, it's, it, it, if you put Spain in this prophecy, it would make no sense. It would be kind of, sorry to it say. It wouldn't make it, any sense today. It, a, it would be irrelevant because Spain isn't a power, so yeah. it wouldn't, wouldn't make sense. But secondly, Spain is now part of the EU. Mm. And, and thirdly, this, Spain historically was not really friendly towards... Israel. I suppose that, it could become too. so. That's right. And, and, and Europe today is not friendly towards no, Israel. Exactly. And Tarshish, you see, is uh, also considered as an independent nation. All right. Mm. And that's why I related it to Brexit, because yeah. the, the one reason why we had to come out of the EU is that God has a particular calling on us as a nation. Mm. And, and it's seen in the fact that we are described as Tarshish. Mm. And, and here, Tarshish, as a nation, combined with her young lions, mm. which I call the Tarshish nations, God is saying that he, in a sense, is, is they're on the right side of the issue. 
It is interesting to me as well that it's the Tarshish nations, which is like we talk about the Commonwealth and United States. All of these are, if you like, the young lions, younger nations that come out from, are the, the allied powers in the two world wars. So you, if you see that from continental Europe, yeah. the greatest threat has yeah. come forth, yeah. it was the Tarshish nations together that, that, that God used to restrain that. Yeah. And now it seems that there's going to be another arising, an evil arising, and God will in some way, whether it's just spiritual, but, but the Tarshish nations are, are again united. So when we join the EU, we, we kind of cut the other Commonwealth nations yeah. loose somewhat yeah. to bind ourselves to Europe. That's it. But that wasn't God's purpose for us. God wanted, wants us now to align more with the Tarshish nations. Great. So what we do is, we're, but that's really given us some food for thoughts, but we can't go further down that road because it literally is, is a whole, um, it is um, prophecy Bible study. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and we could, we could spend a lot more time on it, but it's really good. Just make Sheba sure and Didan, yes. Saudi Arabia. That's yes. the most unlikely alliance, isn't it? It is unlikely. And that's exactly what we've got today. It is, yes. it is Saudi unlikely. Arabia and the Tarshish nations, yeah. America in particular, yeah. United Kingdom, are aligned against you know, Iran and yeah. so, so forth. So, so things, things are happening. Shiban and Didan, Didan. which one is Saudi? Well, it's basically Saudi. Well, is that part of the world? Because you've got the Gulf states, yeah. haven't you, as well? It's, it's essentially yes, Arabia. Yes, okay. It's a grouping, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's very compelling. I, I think it's compelling and, I, you know, that we can talk uh, at length, I think, it's about one, one what the Lord said concerning Daniel. You know, the Lord himself was asked what will be the signs. He didn't say, oh, oh let's just talk about, you know, Jesus loves me, uh, this I know. He, he, he went into great mm. detail. And there are parallels in Daniel with, his, with Ezekiel and what you're saying. Yes. And, um, uh, with this whole part of the world. Go on, I'll give you one more shot because I can see a lot you of papers can, there and I don't want to, no, I I don't want to completely literally, shut Literally, I just want to say one more thing. One more thing. Just to give us hope. Because, yes, please. You know, we can think there's a right mess going on right now. You know, That's we right. deserve to be judged or, yeah. you know, but there is great hope because the, there are prophecies of Tarshish in the millennium in particular. Mm. And there's two in particular. Isaiah 60, yeah. verse 9 and 10. Yeah. And secondly... Psalm well, wait, let's read them. Shall let's we? read them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but if John reads them, then it gives you a little bit of yes. Time to drink no, absolutely. Water. John, Isaiah sixty, verse nine and ten. Yep. Surely the coastland shall wait for me, capital M, and the ships of Tarshish will come first to bring your sons from afar, their silver and their gold with them, to the name of the Lord your God and to the Holy One of Israel because he has glorified you. The sons of foreigners shall build up your walls and their king shall minister to you. For in my wrath I struck you, but in my favour I have had mercy on you. Well, that's wonderful because it fits with what we were talking about that's last just, week. Just, yes. But that's, that's a very important principle through the scriptures. The regathering of, let's talk about the regathering of Israel. Of course. Which is in two stages actually. Yeah. It, the first stage has already happened, but yep. when Christ comes, he'll complete the regathering of Israel. Yeah for the millennium. Yeah. And here it indicates that Tarshish, A, will be a blessed nation in that it will be honoured by God to be able to be part of the blessing of Israel. And people have pointed out, of course, that there's a forerunning fulfilment of this, that the United Kingdom, yeah. you know, in, through the Christian influence, right. we were a big part of the original establishment of Israel. You know, quite remarkably. You know, so, uh, 1917 exactly, in particular. Exactly. So a couple of years ago, I was, um, I was asked if I would chair the Balfour 100 Committee. Right. And, we, and what we did was we, our primary purpose was to establish the, the Christian influence. You know, obviously, there's a lot of Jewish celebrations and celebrations in Israel, and we went to them. You know, as a group, we saw you know, General Allenby uh, lookalikes walking around <laughs> and, and, and Lord Allenby, his, his, um, his descendant, was there. Um, but uh, what, what I find really interesting is that we should aspire to being a godly nation, like the, what God planned for Israel 
we should we we have hymns like and was Jerusalem builded here which people think oh well that's completely off the wall theologically but I don't believe it is that far off that we want the godly holy principles of Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land mm. and that, that fires me up to be involved in all sorts of things that we 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 don't want this whole thousand years of judeo-christian influence in our culture just to be swept aside no. that was my strong feeling yeah, about the yeah. eu that we i don't want to replace of course we've got mythology mm. in britannia and 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 the like um which which is pagan but um we also have a wonderful heritage from alfred the great that i don't want to just let that be subsumed into some Greek mythology about Europa and Zeus. Yeah, <laughs> I just right. don't want it. And I shall just keep saying it, even though people at, in the secular world think we're crackers. Yeah. <laughs> the, and and the, I believe God does have his hand on this nation. And God did use us, you know, in times past through the Christian influence, particularly in to way. bless Israel. Yeah. What happened, of course, as you know, that in the, during the the later times then, we, we forsook our promises to Israel. Mm. And of course, that brought us under a judgment yeah. mm. uh, or a divine discipline, if mm. you like. And, and I know we're not Israel, but you know, often God might work in a parallel way. And one of the I things so. that, that one of the cycles of discipline in Leviticus mm. is that if you sin and you stubbornly sin, you, you, will, you will lose your power as a nation. You'll lose your sovereignty. Mm. And of course, we lost empire Yes, yeah. right. Well, maybe that was going to happen, but it happened yeah. supernaturally quickly, yeah. <laughs> put it that way. Uh, and then secondly, more than that, we actually lost our sovereignty. We That's were right, yeah. well on the way of becoming governed. It was humiliating, by wasn't it, as thing. a nation that was, what, what, before, before we reneged on the Balfour, the principles of the Balfour Declaration, and, and especially mm -hmm. our, you know, after the, the war, didn't even allow them to... Mm -hmm. Those who had been through the concentration camps didn't really even allow them to, in any numbers, return to Israel as promised. Yeah, um, we we yeah, it was a rapid decline. Mm. You yeah. can argue it, it you know, socio-economically, yeah. but we we did decline rapid, rapidly. Mm. Rapid. So on the one hand, you've got God's judgment coming to pass <coughs> on the nation. We who once ruled the waves, mm. and we really did. I mean, the mm. Royal Navy was responsible for our empire, mm. and and we ruled you know, good and bad, um, and, and it just disappeared. And you can see this is God's judgment, mm. but it being the instrument was the, 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 the sat satanization, if I can create mm. a word, of, of our, the way we're governed mm. and, and the willingness of, of our politicians to give away our sovereignty in the face of the will of the people. And That's we right. saw that being fought Very out to a bitter end over Brexit. That's right. Um, That's right. That, that, and and their, their willingness to lie and deceive. I mean, That's I'm right. appalled, absolutely appalled mm -hmm. at the way our it men and women... I mean, politicians generally, you know, can be fast and loose with, with you know, the truth. Yeah. And, 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 and it's like, always been but, so. But if you would have said, like, 10 years ago even, or 20 years, no, 10 years ago, that Brexit would have happened. Yes. If they think you were crazy. Well, yes. Work. Yes. You know, but I believe it was the hand of God. Oh, without doubt. In other words, it's a sign to me that now, this is the problem we have, hand. by the way, because we all agree with each other. <laughs> no, but you just have to look no, at forget, forget, forget whether you're for Brexit or against it. It's happened. I mean, yeah. uh, but we all agree but with each other. It did look at But the fact that flood, that downpour came in in, the, in London at exactly the time to stop people going out to the vet, to vote. <laughs> switched it. <laughs> if they'd gone out, we'd have lost it. Mm, but God yes, caused yes, a downpour. Yes. He caused people to say, "Actually, I don't fancy." <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we will, we will it see. It means that God's hand of blessing is back on the nation. Yeah. I'm not saying yeah. we deserve it, no. but God, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Yeah. Yes. And, and God has a plan and a purpose and a destiny for this nation. Mm. We fulfilled it in part, <clears throat> you know, with the gospel, with blessing Israel, we, bl we blew it. Mm. But the very fact that God has caused Brexit to happen mm. against all the odds, mm to me is a sign that God is re-establishing re Tarshish as a nation, yeah. as is in the prophecies. Yeah. And that therefore, 
God intends to carry out his purpose through Tarshish. So that gives us grounds for hope. That's right. And but it, it's yeah. not as though the battle is completely over. No, no. There's it, all it gives sorts of rear hope. guards going on and um, there is Absolutely. very much the temptation to go back to Egypt and all of that. Um, but I, I think... But yeah, sometimes we can get very pessimistic battle. as Christians and we're so aware of all the negatives. That's right. But, you know, that we need to have some hope that, yeah. that God has not finished with yeah. us and that God w will use us. And, and can I just have what the last scripture, which yeah. is Psalm, yes. oh, yeah, Psalm 72, 10 and 11. And this shows that Tarshish is a blessed nation in, in, the, in the millennium. So... What's um, the scripture again? This is very exciting stuff. So, Psalm Eric. 72. Yeah. I'm just trying to 10. think, what will we do? Verse what will 10. we talk about after Tarshish? Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> the kings of Tarshish and of the isles will bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba will offer gifts. Yes, all kings shall fall down before him. And that's Jesus they're talking about. Mm. Yes, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. Yeah. yeah. So that's grounds for hope, you see, that, that there's a blessing for Tarshish. Mm. Because some nations, as you know, Christ, when he returns, he's going to judge the nations. With a rod he'll of judge iron. individuals between the sheep and the goats, but he'll also judge between the sheep nations and the goat nations. Mm. And there are scriptures on that too, yeah. Yeah. as to which nations will be ble more blessed than others. Yeah. Some nations will cease to exist because of their treatment of Israel in particular. Mm. Some nations will exist like Egypt, but under, be under a certain discipline. Other nations will be blessed. So there's grounds for hope that in whatever time we have left, mm. God does want to use Tarshish. Mm. God has a purpose for Tarshish. Yeah. And, and, and so, I, and we are not, we had to be set apart from Europe. Yeah. Now, so the remarkable purpose. thing is this, while we're on the subject of our heritage, is it has been a bumpy ride. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the Fox's Book of the Martyrs comes to mind. You know, the, those that have stood for God's word, but they're all part of the sort of warp and weft of our whole culture. But um, we've had freedom of preaching on the streets, but then we had John Bunyan put in prison. And now we still apparently still have freedom of speech, but preachers, quite gen gentle-mannered preachers on mm. the streets are being arrested. Uh, so th there is a tension, there's a spiritual battle that's ongoing. You know, we had the time of the Georgians, which was totally decadent. You couldn't say that we were in any way a blessed nation, but God seems to have held us by his grace from just total, just falling into a pit of corruption and decadence. And I, I still believe there's, there's grounds for optimism <coughs> yes. that we can reclaim our culture. Yes, and things we don't understand. You know how he says in Romans 11, is he, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And there's no qualification for that except the Lord will have mercy on whom he'll have mercy. You can't earn it. You can't do anything. And, it, and, and it, if we are part of his plan, and you know, these scriptures are quite compelling, not conclusive, and I say, but quite compelling, then it's huge grounds. And I have to say also our royal family, I, you know, whatever <coughs> folks do personally, and we, we all fail and make mistakes and make poor judgments. But in the Constitution, it's written very clearly to uphold the, the laws of God yes. and the true profession yes. Yes. Of, of the Protestant faith. And, and that's basically our, our stable. Yes. We're in this stable. It's just <coughs> that we've been become alienated because politics has moved away from the Constitution. But our, mm. as it were, unwritten constitution is but quite in the, strong. In the sight of God. In the sight of God. The promises are still made. Believing yes. queen. And the promises are eternal. They don't fade away because the people break their promises. In the eyes of God, these are eternal oaths and they be made and he yeah. honours them. Yeah. You made this pledge to yeah. me. I'm, I'm speaking off the top of my head here. No, it's just how I'm feeling. You know, you made this pledge to me, I heard. At the time you meant it and I'm going to honour that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that there have been a load of rogue since doesn't alter that I will keep my obligation. There's been some milestones. So, uh, yeah. you know, when Cromwell invited the Jews back, that was quite yes, significant. Yeah. I mean, it's a terrible chapter, the Dark Ages before, mm -hmm. where they were banished by Simon de Montfort onwards. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it's very significant, and there's been an ongoing Jewish community in various parts of the UK, but there's a lot of, still a lot of anti-Semitism 
out there. It's incredible how, mm. and in the church. So there's still things that need to be sorted out. Oh, yeah. Uh, did, did Jonah ever get to Tarshish? He didn't. No, no. I don't think he got out of the Mediterranean, as best no. I can tell, <laughs> because we know that the fish, or whatever it was, um, well, it, 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 it had three days and three nights to get to where it was going. Yeah. I, I think he was taking him back to Joppa myself. But, yeah. um, however, it might have been a very fast yeah. fish or whale. Yeah. But um, I don't, I think it's, and, and there are large, for instance, sperm whales operate in the Mediterranean. Mm. So I don't think he got anywhere near Tarshish, actually. No, no. Because no. God sent that storm and uh, no. uh, it, never got, it never got there. But um, the travel agent that he, he looked at told him, you know, um, go to Tarshish, you'll have a whale of a time. <laughs> <laughs> he definitely had that, yeah. definitely had that. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so this is definitely our Tarshish um, Bible study. We've got about 10, ten minutes left. Um, I, I think, I think it, is, it is important for a nation to, to, take a, to take stock, as it were, and see, because we've become very divided as a nation, you know, and it, Europe is part of it, but also um, different philosophies, uh, different religions, and, and a sort of a growing atheistic, militant atheism has grown. So, we, you know, us sitting here in, in this point in, in history, we have, we have quite a task to, to reclaim our schools, to, to reclaim our churches, believe it or not, uh, and to, to get the gospel preached again, mm. and, and to preach um, judgment again, and repentance, because that, we, we, we've sort of back, I'm saying collectively, we've backpedaled on, on things to try and fit in, and um, it hasn't helped anyone. Anyway. I, 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 I believe that the hand of God will intervene again here. You know, the, the prophecy in Joel about pouring out his spirit on all flesh ha was fulfilled in part at Pentecost, but it has not been fulfilled in its, in its fullness of what that. And I believe this will come as in the same way that the Lord said, I will never flood the earth again. He will, he will respond in a different way to the wickedness in all men and mm. pour out his spirit. Mm. This really will be the last chance saloon, yeah. but he will pour out his spirit. So those whom he called before the foundation of the world, those he has predestined will turn mm. and they will be in such numbers mm. that the, 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 the nations will have to follow uh, to an extent because the ungodly will always remain ungodly and they'll always fight the people of God because that's what has, has always happened. Mm. But we will now be, we will then walk as sons of God because this outpouring will be, will be like nothing we've ever seen. Yeah. Mm. And it'll be the equivalent of the flood, but it'll be the spirit yeah. and the nations will respond, the people will respond. Because so, so, it's so still to be fulfilled. That's it. Yes, it is. Um, so I, I've, in these last few minutes, I, I'm conscious of the fact that we have folks watching who don't know the Lord at all. Mm. And somehow we've got to convey, how shall they hear unless there's the preacher? So we've said you, we've got to preach um, judgment. Um, and of course, in Jonah, we're going to get on to, onto that, what Jonah did eventually um, convey his, his message to folks. But how, from, from this passage, just, just say that um, some faithful viewers who don't even know the Lord, I thought, oh, I'm interested in this. Um, where, where do we take them at the end of this Bible study? What, what message do we want to give? Um, and it can be a message about the scriptures as a whole, but what, what, what can we give to folks watching now? Well, we, it's actually a quote from later in yeah. Jonah, where he says, salvation is of the Lord. Mm. And, and really, our message really is man, cannot save himself. You can't save yourself. However, you know, you're, you might be aware that God seems a long way away or, or whatever and that your life is in a mess, but there is only one, one answer, mm. one, one place to go. Salvation is of the Lord. Only God mm. can save you. Mm. And the, the great good news is that God loves you so much that actually he became a man in the person of Jesus Christ to save you. And more than that, he, he took all your sin, everything that is in the way of you 
becoming connected and, and one with God again, uh, he took all your sin on the cross and he paid the price in full for you to be forgiven, mm. to have eternal life. And mm. the, this is the central message of the Bible, you might yeah, say. that's right. And it says, you know, all who believe in him, who trust in him, mm. who give their hearts to him, will not perish, but have eternal life. Yeah. Yes, there is a warning. If you refuse the offer, yeah. it, it's like sin is this deadly disease, if you like, a deadly virus. Mm. And there is only one cure, and that's to come to Jesus and give your heart to him, mm. and, and he will save you. Yeah. And he will give you a wonderful new life. But you have to personally come and receive him for yourself. You can't just say, well, I, I grew up in church, I'll be fine. Mm. You, you have to come to him and you have to say, Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. I, I put my trust in you. Mm. I receive you as my savior and my Lord. And the Bible says you then pass from death to life. That's right. Praise so so I, I am concerned for people who attend church and don't know the Lord, but church attendance is going down. <laughs> So far, um, Rev Revelation TV is a, is a very important mm. vehicle to get the message across to people who, uh, we are living in, you know, Nineveh or, or ancient Tarshish. You know, we, we are living in a, in a godless age mm. where people, you, they look at the statistics they don't know in school. They're deliberately not taught no, they're taught. And, and about and God. No, you know, and history has been rewritten as well as yeah. part of the... So it's a challenge for someone who's completely unscripted, un illiterate, biblically yeah. illiterate. So even, even that message of the gospel, it, it, you need to have an audience. You, someone needs, needs to sit down and listen carefully. What, what is being said yes. the, the, you know, about the nature of God and the nature of, yeah. of man? Yeah. Often one, one objection uh, raised to the, 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 the message that, Derek just gave is, yes, but you don't know what I've done. People yeah. believe they've just, what they have done is unforgivable. Mm. And the answer to that is it isn't. Right. The Lord knows exactly what you've done. Yeah. He knows exactly what we've all done. Mm. And he's made a way. He's taken the mm. price for that. He's paid the wages of that sin. Yeah. He's paid it. Yeah. Mm. I, I, I find let it, it hold you it is, it, it, if you come out of the secular materialistic mindset and then uh, and consider you know uh, right and wrong a and then the fact that adam and eve and their offspring turned away from god mm. they, they did not want to retain the knowledge of god and it got into as you said some really brutal dark times um through through the history of humanity what how does God break back in? And it's, he breaks back in through the scriptures, through the message of mm. salvation. But, but it takes time, not because God um, needs time. We need time, as it were, to assimilate the message that, that's spoken, that's distorted by the enemy of God, that uh, then uh, needs to be written down so it can be proved. And that's prophecy it's written down we can prove God's word um, through prophecy um, and then uh, you know w wake up as it were conscience again and hopefully wake wake up a nation's conscience again but I do I do see it as quite quite a battleground if you do watch I know that John says oh no I don't I don't watch the BBC but if you do watch the sort of the the culture of our the prevailing culture you see that it, it's in human terms, it seems really difficult mm. to, break, to break back when there's been this total rejection of, of the Christian message. We're in the last minute, and I don't normally sum up too early, but um, I, I thank you very much, Derek, for that, that insight. We nearly became a Q&A. <laughs> we just <laughs> wrenched it back um, to, to being a Bible study. But um, I think that we will definitely come back to the, the end times prophecies because they're, they're sort of shouting at us you know, in, many, in many ways in what's happening around us today. Thank you very much for watching. We look forward to being with you again next week as we study Jonah.